you're very welcome. You should hopefully be in the right place. You're joining the National Fire Chiefs Council's um, webinar on water safety, and we've got some wonderful guests to talk to you about open water safety. So it's now a minute past, so I will for formally start the webinar. So welcome again to those that are just joining us. Um, so why are we doing today? Well, it is this week International Women's Day. Um, for those that don't know, it's actually on the 8th, so we're a day early. Um, but it seemed like a great opportunity to get a group of passionate women together to talk about water, water safety, open water swimming and all aspects of water, really. So that's why we're here. What we'll be doing today is recording the speakers. Um, obviously, uh, for those people that are watching it, you won't be recorded, but recording so we can share more widely because today's event is fully subscribed and we appreciate not everybody could make um, the time this afternoon. So first and foremost, let me introduce you to our guests who you can hopefully see. Um, so I'm going to follow my screen pattern around. I'm going to start by introducing Gabby, Gabby Batchelor. Give everybody a wave, Gabby. So Gabby is from the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, the RNLI, and also um, is a RLSS member, Royal uh, Life Saving Society. And uh, Gabby is a passionate uh, swimmer as well, and I know involved in King Alfred and lots of other water work in, um, in her her own time as well as in her career. Uh, let me introduce Susan Taylor to you, give them a wave Susan. Um, Susan works in East Sussex Fire and Rescue Service, she's part of our um, community safety team and she is the education lead for water safety. She also does road and fire and other things as well, but Susan was instrumental in developing our approach to water safety um, in East Sussex Fire and Rescue. Can I also introduce Isabel, <clears throat> Isabel Howey, um, down that. OK, Isabel um, is an outdoor swimmer and a volunteer for the Outdoor Swimming Society and the, is part of the Inland Access team and also a member of Sheffield Outdoor Plungers. And you'll hear more about soup later. Can I introduce Imogen to you? Giving you a wave at the top there. Um, and Imogen is an equally an outdoor swimmer, a blog author, um, if you have followed some of Imogen Riverswims.co.uk, you'll have read some of her um, inspirational um, blogs about swimming and also a volunteer for the Outdoor Swimming Society and the Inland Access team. Can I introduce Dee Harmer? <coughs> Give us a wave, Dee. That's down there. Dee is an open, open water swimming coach, founder of Fish to Water and um, which she'll tell you probably a little bit about as she, she talks. Um, an RNLI water safety advisor, a surf life saving GP coach, and a scuba diving instructor. So actually, she's got webbed feet. Um, so those are our speakers for this afternoon. Um, and I'm very pleased to have you all with us, ladies. So uh, what we're going to do this afternoon is I've got a series of questions which I'm going to put to our panel and they're going to give you the benefit of their experience and uh, insight. Um, and hopefully at the end, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask any questions. So there is a chat facility. Don't be shy if you've got questions or burning questions about water swimming or open water swimming, you can pop them in there. I will just give you, uh, I suppose there's a government health warning at the front end. If there's loads of questions, we might not get through them all, but we will endeavour to get responses from our specialist speakers this afternoon and get those to you later. And if we publish the recording, obviously we can put some of the answers um, in that as well. So without further ado, and you've probably heard enough from, from me, I'm going to open up uh, the webinar by starting with our first question. Um, and the first question, I'm going to direct to Gabby and to Susan and it's really about the importance of water safety education and drowning prevention. Um, so over to you ladies, Have um, you have about 10 minutes to talk about this particular subject. I know you could talk all, all afternoon but yeah interested to hear what you've got to say. Fantastic, thank you Dawn and uh, welcome everyone. First of all I just want to say 
I'm so excited that we have um, already here a group of um, individuals who are passionate about open water swimming and water safety and it's just fantastic to see that you've all taken this time out of your afternoons to join us so a huge thank you. Um, as Don mentioned so I work for the RNLI as a water safety education manager. I work in the southeast region of England and I also uh, volunteer as an instructor and a development officer for RLSS which is the Royal Life Saving Society. Now both those organisations they are there to influence partners, influence people and influence the communities in drowning prevention. They want to reach people months and years before they get into difficulty and they really essentially just want everyone to enjoy the water. But if I strip all of that back and I strip back my roles and my hats and everything else, I'm simply just an individual who's incredibly enthusiastic about the outdoors, about nature and how it can enhance your life, how it enhances my life. Um, I swim, as Dawn said, but I don't do it competitively. I've got Raynaud's disease, so I use that to really understand how, how I can get involved in the activity and it really affects how I get involved in particular stuff which involves you know, cold environments. Um, but essentially, I just want everyone to enjoy the water. So of course, yes, I'm here to talk about drowning prevention, but before I go into any more detail, I just really want to emphasise, um, you know, I'm just representing everyone and, you know, any individual involved in water. Um, Susan, I'll let you introduce yourself first and then we can go into a bit more depth about drowning prevention. If you're there, Susan. Yeah, thank you, Gabby. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And, and I too am delighted to be here this afternoon to talk to you about, you know, the roles that, that I have for water safety for the fire service and, and having started working for the fire service around six or seven years ago um, in a completely different role um, I took on the role of, of water safety knowing absolutely nothing about it. Um, now I am a font of all knowledge, um, I have uh, lovingly got the name of Safety Susan amongst all of my friends but having three children myself, two boys especially in the 20s um, who I have discovered are very much our at risk groups. Um, we all have that real vested interest um, in promoting water safety. And as Gabby rightly said, in the years before uh, people actually really need to use it, um, hopefully we have it kind of embedded um, with our younger generation and those who maybe are older and, and want to take risks. So, you know, I'm now very much passionate about what I do and um, I'm really, really keen for everybody to take something from this webinar this afternoon. I'm really delighted to be invited to share that with you all. Thanks, Gabby. No worries. Um, thank you, Susan. So just a little bit more about the uh, two various organisations and how they um, prioritise water safety. So the RLSS it is a charity which leads in the delivery of life saving and lifeguarding awards and um, it has it's the governing body for life saving clubs and there are so many benefits to being involved in life saving clubs so do take your chance when this webinar is over just have a look at what life saving clubs are near your area if you're interested. The RNLI in its 199th year I have to add that in um, is water safety is very much driven by an evidence led approach and that's all about reaching our life saving goals through education, through partnerships, uh, through communities, raising awareness and just general safety advice. So we uh, look after campaigns such as the Float to Live campaign, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Um, and we work with external organisations and the community to deliver various uh, things like the Waterside Responder Scheme, water safety education. So we go to thousands of young children every year. This is across Ireland and the UK. And we reach that, um, that young audience that we, um, we really want to kind of influence to take those messages home so they know how to be safe in and around the water. So just a few um, interesting points about Dawn's initial question. Why is water safety so important? Why is water safety education such a priority? So in 2020, there were over 600 UK drownings altogether, but there were 140 cycling fatalities. Now I say, but of course, that's incredibly sad, but it just gives you a little bit of perspective in terms of that difference, that there is cycling proficiency in schools, but water safety in England, and I do emphasize England because it does differ across the different nations, 
water safety is in the PE curriculum, but it is not mandatory in the curriculum. So we are working with the government. We're working with a variety of organisations to really influence them to take this on board and take on a pri take this on as a priority because water safety should be mandatory in the curriculum. But as I mentioned, we have a whole host of volunteers. We have a whole host of different organisations that we work with to really encourage them to advocate for drowning prevention. Um, Susan, I know you've got a little bit more to add to that as well. Yeah, thanks, Gabby. And, and indeed, with that in mind and, and the, the fact that there is that gap, we as a fire service, you may know or you may not, we actually respond to inland water related emergencies and rescues. So for us, um, we have to we obviously work around risk as well. And it is in our interest to make sure that people are aware of how to keep themselves as safe as possible in and around areas of water. And, and just like Gabby, we are really fortunate to potentially engage with thousands of people each year in all of our activities. So we want to make our contact count and, and water safety is, is one of those really important elements that we do try um, and you know engage with people around from little tots that come to visit us at station open days to university students to those that visit nighttime economies, you know, at Christmas and summer and you know all different types of events we make our contact count and working with wonderful um, organizations such as the RNLI and the RLSS as well as many other you know water safety organizations we try and make that contact count by sharing as many many important education pieces around water as we can. Gary? Brilliant and I think leading on from that point about young people we do naturally think of education when it comes to parents and schools and colleges um, and we talk about it in a very kind of formal manner however and this is important it's important in influencing the space and crucial to our work but it doesn't just stop at 18 it you know it carries on through all life stages and I think there's various phrases such as cradle to grave but essentially it's a lifelong view of water safety education and we have to simply just adapt our messaging so what I really want everyone to take away from today's webinar when you hear from everybody is just feel responsible for your community and just feel inspired to be responsible for water safety because it isn't just up to us it's not just up to an organization or lifeguards on the beach for example or the coast guard it's actually everyone's responsibility if you were crossing a road and you saw someone was about to cross and the car was coming you'd probably stop that well i hope everyone would so essentially this is where i'm just going to ask you to just take away one thing and think about what you could do to help us because it's, I'm not it's not a selling pitch but essentially we really do need your help when it comes to a uh, to sharing some of these vital water safety messaging Um, something else I also sort of want to mention is that um people they get into trouble because they haven't made a plan and I know the ladies are going to talk about water safety in terms of what to do to keep safe later on but it's so important to remember that yes we're all talking about this a couple of us from professional points of view some of us from real good experience but in fact, I've got myself into trouble a couple of times, so don't be too um, put off by the fact that we're giving you all this information today. But in fact, I've actually got myself to the point where I wasn't quite sure what direction I need to go to to get back to shore. So just really want to emphasise that as well. Um, and I know, Susan, you're not going to put it out there, but I know you're taking some swimming lessons. So it's, um, you know, everyone's involved in different ways. Yeah, yeah. Ladies, I've definitely. got a question for you, if I can just come in and um, we'll have questions at the end anyway. Yeah. But just on the education front, um, so you've talked obviously about the importance of everybody having a role and and I know Susan's parent is a parent, I'm a parent as well. Um, very often I, I've done some work with parents who've lost loved ones um, to drowning and one of the first things they say to me is I wish I knew now what I've learnt you know, since. Um, how do we educate parents? So from our perspective, we we have to reach out to them by adapting our messaging. So we have um, a, a variety of different events that we invite the public to. We ask parents to get involved by um, taking on that responsibility for their children to um, 
essentially it's about giving them an understanding and there are so many different ways that we can do that so it, it's a really broad question to be honest but I think what we need to do is just give them a better understanding of how they can just keep their families safe. So that's through social media, whether that's through um, different swimming groups and networks, whether that's through just training. Um, the RLSS, for example, host um, baby kind of ways to you know, train, save a baby's life, save a child's life, that kind of thing. Um, like I mentioned, the life saving clubs are there. So we just need to use our networks, use your networks and I would say that there's we need to adapt to what society is doing at the moment. And that's why I mentioned the whole social media aspect as well. I don't know, Susan, you've got a couple of things to add on that as well. Yeah, no, I, I do. I, I absolutely totally agree. And I think the more that we speak to our young people, they go home and they repeat these messages, hopefully to their parents as well. I mean, some some of you may be interested to know that it's really unfortunate. And I am also a runner and I didn't know this, but almost half of the people who drown in the UK, it happens to runners, to walkers, to people who have no intentions of entering the water, so are ill-prepared as to know what to do if that happens. So we do a lot of work around educating people of that. And, and when I spoke earlier around, you know, the fact that we visit nighttime economies, you know, a quarter of, of all adult uh, drowning victims, unfortunately, have alcohol or drugs in their in their bloodstream and and the shocking statistic for me is that 89 percent of men who go missing on a night out are unfortunately found dead in water so you know the more that we can kind of promote have fun enjoy water we know we, we are in no way trying to put people off but it's just how to be as safe as, as, as you can be enjoy it but do it safely and if you want to you know have fun and, and have thrill seeking activities then do it but you know do it um you know the co-steering do it under um you know you've got someone there who's showing you what to do um but just do it as safely as you can um but yeah great Thank you. So I, I think the message is loud and, and clear from Gabby and Susan there. Education is a lifelong journey with water. And actually, I think you're going to hear from when you hear from the other speakers, um, don't assume because you can swim that that you're fully educated in all environments. And we're going to hear from you know other people now about some of those factors. So thank you both Gabby and Susan for your input on education. I can see there's a few questions pinging up as well. We'll come back to those at the end. Um, I'm going to move on if I can now and introduce um, my next question, which I'm directing um, to Imogen and to Isabel. And this is about the benefit and the facts to consider, not forgetting these two ladies are open water swimmers, um, the facts to consider when open or wild swimming. And but as they, because I know you've got some slides you'd like to share, so as they get those ready, um, I'm sure just an interesting fact that some of you will know, just the growth in open and wild swimming um, across the world really, but definitely in the UK, and I'm sure the ladies will touch on that. Over to you, Imogen and Isabel. Yeah, when I put the slides on, I won't be able to see anybody. So if you need me to change the slides, Imogen, you need to say next slide, um, a bit like Chris Whitty. And, and you know, so you just need to, to give me a nod and not a nod, <laughs> you need to tell me. So I'm going to share the slides now and then I won't be able to see anybody. OK. Yeah, they're up. That, that you can see that. OK, Imogen, okay. do you want to introduce um, yourself? Yes, so um, uh, I've, I've been introduced by Dawn, so probably don't need to say any more other than I'm, I'm a swimmer, as you said. Um, so I was going to go on to the next slide and start talking about the benefits first. Um, and there are a load of benefits. We've listed lots and lots on the slides and you'll be relieved I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, some, some, some of these benefits are, are evidence, there's research, some of them are more anecdotal, um, but there are people uh, working on, on that research now. And one of, one of those, there's many, but one of them is uh, Dr. Mark Harper, who's also a cold water expert. And I think he's summed it up very nicely by saying it's a holistic thing. You've got exercise, which we all know is a good thing. You've got uh, doing things in nature, in green and blue spaces. You've got the community, and we're going to say a bit more about that shortly. 
and then you've got the benefits of cold water itself and of course not forgetting it's fun um, so out of all of those benefits the ones related to cold i'm just going to pick one out of the list to talk a little bit more about which is stress tolerance and what that is I'm sure a lot of you have heard of cold water shock, and that's something that happens where your body automatically responds when you get into cool water. And it responds uh, by your heart rate going up, your breathing might get faster, uh, you might take a gasp. Now, if you're in a safe position when that happens, so you're standing there or you're ready to set, set off swimming, you're, um, and you get over that in a minute or two, um, that gives you a benefit that your body is being put under a, a, a deliberate stress. But as a result uh, of doing this uh, about six to ten times um, over a period of a number of weeks, your body adapts and that ad adaptation um, leads to you being more able to deal with stresses, the everyday uh, everyday life stresses of modern life or the bigger ones. And that's just one of many benefits that are talked about from cold water, there's a relief of menopause. There's many more. I'm not going to go into any of those. I just very, very briefly wanted to say that. Um, and then just another thing, one other thing to pick out is that there are many benefits to the individual from all of us who swim. We get, uh, you know, a, a variety of different benefits, but we also have a wider benefit to society, if you like, which is things like, you know, people are helping their own health mental or physical health and that's saving money to, to the health service There's economic benefits. And then there's the fact that people who immerse themselves in in, in nature and how, how much more immersed can you get than getting into some water are the people who care about the environment. So I'm not going to say any more about benefits. We are going to share some links later on, which will will um, you know, you can have a look and, and one of them is a video with Mark Harper talking through some of the things I mentioned. So I'm going to just uh, mention, uh, to say a little bit about the outdoor swimming community, the informal community, and that community is part of the beneficial side of things. Um, just to give an overview before Izzy goes into a bit more detail. So there are groups all over the country, there's around about 500 groups roughly, and they're everywhere. And the membership of those groups is, is difficult to calculate, but very roughly it's getting on for about a million people across the UK. Um, but those groups are everywhere. They're by the coast, they're inland. They might be big groups across a county with tens of thousands of members, or they might be a tiny group of a few hundred people over there near their local river. Um, so they're all over the place. They, they vary a lot in their characteristics. These groups they are all informal. And the very crucial thing that they they all have in common is that they are based on taking responsibility for your own safety. Um, Within those groups, swimmers themselves vary a lot. You've got um, people who might swim uh, a long challenge, uh, 10 kilometres or something. They might be training for a race. There might be people who swim all year, just dipping in winter, um, just swimming in summer maybe. Um, they might be going with their families in summer. They might, some of the, the members of the swim community haven't actually started swimming yet. They're very interested and they're building up their confidence in these, in these swim groups. Um, and, and they will be joining joining us and gaining all those benefits. And um, around about very roughly 70% of the informal swim community is women. So I'm going to hand over to Izzy now to talk in a bit more detail about one of these groups in particular and also about how the informal swim groups so, um, uh, work in the water safety area. So next slide to Izzy. OK, um, just to say I'm absolutely delighted to be here and, um, you know, celebrating the role of women in in this environment um, because there are so many of us, as Imogen's pointed out. I'm up here in Sheffield and I say up here because a lot of the people I think um, on the panel are, are, are people down south. And um, so we, we're particularly sort of focusing on in, inland waters and what happens in inland waters. And Sheffield Outdoor Plungers is an informal group of which there are many springing up around the country, as Imogen has said. And I think there's going to be something put in the chat about um, how you find out about these informal groups. And I was really struck by what Gabby said. Um, 
when she said about being responsible for your community. And I think that epitomises really how Soup tries to um, approach water safety. So it's an informal group. Um, it organises around social media, particularly Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp groups and things like that, sharing swimming spots, arranging swims, meeting people. And this is a lovely picture of one of our reservoirs in Sheffield. Um, and we pride ourselves in Sheffield of being the outdoor city. And um, so that's why that's there in, in the water. We're very keen on soup to draw on the evidence as, as I think it was Gabby who was saying it might have been Susan. Um, we particularly interested in knowing what is best practice around keeping people safe. So you'll see here that we pull on the Outdoor Swimming Society's information and that's um, taken from national leaders um, around you know, helping people stay safe in open water. Open water is very different to pools, so you know we do stress the need for self-reliance and for um, risk assessments that people are gaining confidence and ability to do for themselves because often they are unaccompanied swimmers. They're not there swimming with a lifeguard or with um, the swim coach, although we do have swim coaches locally who do operate. So one of the things that we're really keen to do is actually encourage people to think about the risks that they may be encountering because cold water is different to a pool. It's become more popular, but there isn't necessarily the associated um, support to go with that. So we try and fill that gap and do some informal influencing through that network effect that Gabby mentioned. So we do try and take a lot of responsibility for our community without actually taking specific responsibility, if that makes sense. So we encourage people to think about what they will need to think about if they're going to get into the water, about building their confidence slowly through experience, doing some reading, being prepared, asking for help, thinking about swimming their own swim, so not swimming somebody else's swim, but actually thinking about their, their own abilities. And one of the best um, pieces of information I've seen about this recently is something that was done by Straight Line Swimming, and it they worked with Dr, I think, oh, is she a professor or a doctor? I'm not sure, Heather Massey, who works with um, Professor Mike Tipton down south. And they teamed up with her and did some evidence-based information out to people but they've done it in a really fun way I think and it's very accessible and it gets people to ask questions of themselves and we do this too through soup we ask get people to ask themselves you know how are they feeling today what do they know about their own abilities you know how what do they know about the weather forecast the speed of the wind the direction how hungry they are how how well they've slept and I really would encourage people to go and have a look at some of the links because because this is, as I say, one of the best pieces of short advice and information out to informal swimmers that I've I've seen. And it is very colourful, as you can see from the pictures that were done by Gillian MacArthur. And one of the things that I, I was really struck about when I was thinking about this is I, I work in public health and um, I work around behavioural change and, I, and I've been thinking very a lot about the kind of social networking effect, you know, and, on behaviour. We are all very social creatures, you know, we like to do what other people are doing and we watch what other people are doing and we notice what people are doing. And I think one of the great things about the informal networks is we have an opportunity to encourage people to um, develop these positive social norms and self-reliance and following the herd by dropping information into those groups. And we're very, as I said earlier, very careful to make sure that we follow best practice around that. We have moderators who work on the group, as do the Outdoor Swimming Society, and um, we do make sure that we do follow the best practice that we can. And one of the, the things I wanted to say about that is, is really this power that women can play. And Gabby mentioned it earlier, that bit about how do we reach into our communities and into our, our friendship groups and share that best practice. And I do think that we have a, a role to play in that and we try to take that role seriously and sensibly. And one of the things that I'll just give you an illustration that we're very conscious that it's quite 
quite sunny here in Sheffield actually today and it has been the weather's been sort of warming up a bit the air temperatures have been going up but the water temperatures haven't and one of the things we did the other day was um, just behind the scenes say you know could somebody drop some information onto the group about how cold the water is and and that actually you know it, it's going to be cold for quite some time to come so anybody thinking of starting out they need to take that into account and also others who might be thinking of sort of pushing the boundaries a little bit might want to just you know hold back and and think carefully about how cold the water still is so I think women have a great role to play um, as mothers as friends as as um, sisters as cousins as as members of the community and we do try and encourage people to do that by sharing the well-being tips and benefits but also around the safety tips as well but I think the final thing I wanted to say was that one of the things we're also conscious about um, as a swimming community as an informal swimming community is that we only plug a certain gap you know there are ongoing health inequalities and lack of access for certain groups and I think that you know as a as a community uh, as a nation you know we we have a responsibility to try and reach out and work with as many communities and people as we can to build that swimming culture that positive safety um, and enjoyment culture that that people have spoken about already and our final slide is just our links, which I'm hoping that might have been dropped into the chat. And the the, the final picture there is actually a piece of water that we swam in last year, and it, and it really was very chilly. And so, you know, we do take our safety um, information out to people very seriously because we're we're a northern city, and we do have some chilly temperatures to go with that, along with some beautiful summer temperatures as well. So I'll leave it there and I'll um, draw us back in. So I don't know if. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Isabel, and thank you, Imogen. Um, I'm convinced. Uh, so I, as an open water swimmer, I am, I will admit, a warm weather open water swimmer, uh, not an all year rounder, but that's fine, isn't it? I think people need to make their own choices and decisions. And you've emphasised that beautifully about, you know, swim your own swim, do what suits you. Um, I, I think one thing I just wanted to ask you about, because I know um, lots of people are considering um, open water swimming and the dynamics of open water swimming in different locations are very different. So there are people who've been, you know, experienced open water swimming in rivers or in static lakes um, and come down to the coast. Could I just ask you to touch on, I think Dee's going to cover the, the sort of swimming in the sea element of things because that's uh, her field of expertise. But in terms of what you think um, the differences are and then that will lead us beautifully into D. but from an inland swimming perspective. Shall I? Um, I think um, that's where the beauty of these groups come in because if you're somebody who thinks I'm going to go and do some swimming find your local group and they will know the local rivers or lakes or whatever you've got in that area and they will know you know places that are relatively uh, benign to go when to go how to do it safely so rivers obviously have currents and all sorts of complications like that but people will know about that locally and you can also learn about it theoretically but you can learn about the specifics locally likewise with lakes there'll be factors and reservoirs likewise so so i think that would be my key answer not to give you all the answers now because it'll take too long but and also hopefully some of our links particularly if you go to the outdoor swimming societies what they call their survive section. There's a massive number of um, posts about all different types of water. So that's another resource. So that's what I would suggest. Local groups and resources yeah. are a brilliant way to find out. We do, we do really encourage people to ask questions. You know, I, I'm I'm an inland swimmer primarily, but I love I love sea swimming, but I don't feel as confident around sea swimming. You know, I know enough about water safety to know that that there are key differences. And I, and I think we're blessed in some ways with our large bodies of water inland because they don't move as swiftly. We don't have the currents and the changes that the sea has, you know, so that's actually a good thing. But we do have some very deep bodies of water and they can be a little bit deceptive sometimes, you know, in terms of people getting out of their depth if they don't have 
the experience. So, you know, there are different factors to consider. Thank you very much both. So uh, thank you for your comments and that will lead me straight into Dee, who is going to start with, I think, making a point before I ask her the yeah, question. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to ask um, Isabel and Imogen, how do people um, that are seeking these um, community groups, how do people know that these community groups are giving them the right information? Because as we know, these community groups are popping up everywhere in all locations, all along yeah, the coast. I think it's some of question. these groups aren't necessarily passing on the information that I believe that, that that you guys are. So how can people tell the difference between a group that's telling them the right thing and a group that's leading them the wrong way? Well, I, I would say that all, all of the different groups are, are, are in a number of networks. The, there's, there's about three different networks and those networks, one of them is the Outdoor Swimming Society Network, which is mm. the one I post about. They have they network amongst themselves and and um, people uh, they're all administered in a in kept an eye on moderated is the right, the right word and so uh, you do occasionally get somebody popping up in a group and saying something and as a moderator you know not such a good idea to say that so you you jump in and if it's really bad you take it off and if it's if it's, <laughs> if it's something that needs a comment on you make a comment so. Um, uh, it is. It is. Although it's very informal, uh, fluid network, there is some control over it. It's not yeah. linked to go wild, if you see what I mean. Um, so, but also, it's also made clear to people this is not the bible of everything, and, and nobody is the bible actually. I think professionals are not the bible. We're not the bible, so to speak. You know, we're not. It's not set in stone. So, um, I think you're right to say that you. You know, don't believe everything you read, but 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 we do take great care over that, and and that would apply to 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 all, virtually all groups, I would say. Yeah. I yeah, think great. And, and you know, the, we haven't got much time, but one of the things I was going to say is that I think as a country, you know, we are developing that positive culture, but we're not quite there yet. You know, I and I think you know, there's a lot of work still to do you know but we try and play our part by making sure that we're as good as we can be and if we spot something that we do try and 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 influence that and i think i think you're right um just before i ask the question it's a partnership sort of approach isn't it there's the open water swimming clubs rlss rnli um Clouds River Trust, all the organisations that are working together to try and promote the positive messaging um, and hopefully point people in the right direction. But um, yes, I, I think the message out of today is if you do a bit of reading and preparation, you'll probably spot the, the clubs that are giving you the right information. Thank you <laughs> to Imogen and Isabel. Um, moving on then uh, to Dee, who's uh, our last panel member to speak today. But the um, the question we've got to pose to you today is the key messages we can share to promote safety when swimming outdoors. And I know you'll mention the sea as it is an area um, that you're very familiar with. So over to you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely thrilled to be here as well with this uh, amazing panel of women, all very knowledgeable and uh, yeah, very honoured. So um, yeah, I was just going to touch base really on on the safety aspects and things really we need to be considering before we are engaging in either open water swimming, open water dipping, um, whether it be rivers, lakes or the sea. Some of it applies to both, um, but there's obviously specifics that apply to the sea. The, the first thing really is just about making sure that you're proficient, that you're strong enough to be putting yourselves in these situations. Even as a strongest swimmer, we obviously know that, that you know difficulties can happen. Like Gabby said earlier, she's had situations as have I, you know, and I consider myself uh, quite a strong swimmer. But my advice really is if, if you can't tread water, if you can't float on your back and you can't make some good headway in water with your feet off the ground, really you shouldn't be in open water. Um, and, and maybe that's that that's the little uh, push that you need to go and get some swimming lessons to make sure that if you do want to enjoy the open water that you have those skills so that you don't put either yourself or somebody else in a situation where they might need to have to perform a rescue to help you out so really it's about making sure that you've helped yourself before putting yourself in that situation um the next piece of safety information I think should be out there really is just all about knowledge and we've talked a lot about knowledge and how 
knowing what's going on out there empowers you. So I like to use sort of the acronym ASK. So it's always seek knowledge. Um, if you have empowered yourself with the knowledge, then you, you are giving yourself the best chances to make good choices when you're out in the water. So um, things like an, an introduction to open water swimming, I run them regularly. And in these introductions to open water swimming, I teach people how to know what the currents are doing, how to read tide times to make sure that you are planning your swim if you're swimming away from the beach in particular to plan your swim either, you know, with the tide assisting you the whole way or into the tide first, or into the current first so that the tide is assisting you on the way back. We talk about the wind conditions and how the wind affects the water. You know, will it assist you? Will it make swimming harder? What will it do to the water quality? Will it, will it make big waves? Will it cause a huge dump on the shore? Um, you know, in the lakes and rivers isn't my specialty, but I would imagine if it's a really windy day, it would be equally as hard on, on, on a big lake, reservoir, river, of things like that. Um, you know, things like knowing how to spot rips, knowing what to do should you get caught in a rip, um, personal survival skills treading water, the floating, we practice all of that. So if if there is nobody in your area that's running things like introductions to open water or introductions to your lakes or specific to your venue, you know, um, have a little look around. There's some good webinars, much like this one, but, um, you know, more specific to safety. So uh, a webinar possibly could be something that you could do to help yourself just make those those um, those good choices. And the next thing I really advocate, which some people are a fan of and some people aren't, is one of these, a tow float. You might have seen, oh, it might go blurry actually with my blurry background. I'm a huge fan of a tow float, okay? It inflates, you've got a little valve here, and um, there are certain tow floats, actually I'll move back a little bit, that have got a bag inside them of which you can put uh, a mobile phone, your keys, maybe a little snack. In case you get hungry. Um, they have a waist belt so they attach around your waist and you swim with the tow float attached to you. Now I do understand that not everybody when they just go down the beach during the summer holidays or, or wherever with your children would necessarily go oh I'm just going in for a quick dip with the kids I'm going to put a tow float on. So it is about making those choices if you're possibly not a strong swimmer and you do decide you want to go in the sea, what I want to emphasize is that tow floats are not a life-saving device. They are just there to act as um, a visual. So should you get yourself into trouble, um, people would be able to see you, but it's not just the people from the shore that can see you, it's also the water users out in the sea. So if you are swimming somewhere where it's quite busy, a tow float could possibly let stand up puddle boarders, kite surfers, motorboat users uh, know you're there. If they can't see you, they can't avoid you. So I'm a real advocate in wearing a tow float. There is a time and a place for them. They're not great in big surfing conditions. So if you are swimming in surf in that um, manner, then a tow float is probably not going to be your best friend. But again, are you going to put yourself in surfing conditions if you're not a good swimmer as well. So that's one of my um, my big likes for swimming. Another good one um, along with the tow float is to wear a nicely, nice brightly coloured swim hat, a little fished water here one. So being, uh, being seen out at sea, really important, um, not only from the shore, but from people out at sea. Uh, I, I try and always go with a group, a buddy, have a shore spotter so try not to try not to be out there on your own I know it's not always possible if you've got a lunch break and you're going for a lunch break swim or a dip and you, you've got half an hour and you can't always have someone there with you if that's not possible perhaps send a text message to somebody say hey I'm going for a swim I'll message you when I'm back out at least then if you haven't messaged within half an hour or something there, there's somebody there that's looking out for you so make sure you you've got somebody looking out for you it's it's really good to know that you've got a community behind you or or someone there that that knows what's happening um, as we've talked a little bit about cold water swimming and and the cold water swimming comes with those extra um extra uh what what's the word i'm looking for extra considerations 
So we get asked quite a lot, how long should I be staying in the cold water? And um, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, of chat about, about this subject, about how long. So what we're trying to advise people to do is, is not think necessarily about how long you're staying in. It's more thinking about how do you feel today? We talked a little bit about with that lovely um, illustration from Gilly MacArthur. Um, I'm also part of the Straight Life Swimming Coaches as well. So we share that message quite a bit. And it's all about how are you feeling on that day? We're all different body shapes and sizes. Some people feel the cold more than others. Some people are acclimatized to those winter um, water temperatures. So it's about staying in as long as you feel you are going to get the benefits. How long is that? There is no particular answer for how long that could be. So um, the way I like to do it is I, I get myself in the water nice and slowly. I feel that initial cold shock with my feet firmly on the ground. I get some cold water on my face always before I swim out of my depth. Once I'm in the water, once I've had that first thought of, oh, I'm feeling a bit chilly, that's my first barrier that's popped in. I'll then the second barrier will pop in and I'll I'll think to myself, yeah, I'm cold again and I will always get out before I start shivering. So it's it's about experience and it's about um, getting those lovely benefits of the cold if that is your aim and then getting out and getting yourself warm. What we need to remember, um, which is part of the research done by Dr. Heather Massey and um, Dr. Mike Tipton was about the um, the after drop and how the after drop affects people when they get out from the water. Now, the after drop is a condition where your body continues to cool for about 20 or 30 minutes once you've exited the water. So what you need to do is you need to leave yourself a little bit of reserve. So you don't get out the water when you're absolutely frozen. You get out the water when you've had a nice time and you're still quite capable of walking up the beach and holding a conversation because you need to give yourself another 20 minutes for your body to cool. What happens is we, we, we cool from the outside in, but we also heat from the outside in. So it's important once you're out the water, you get your wet stuff off nice and quickly, get your dry clothes on, your hat, your gloves, um, get yourself a sugary drink, get that metabolism going, keep moving, try not to sit still for too long or, le you know, we all like to have a little cup of coffee or whatever down the beach and a biscuit. So, um, don't stand around for too long if you are feeling feeling that. Um, it's important to recognise the signs of hypothermia when you're when you're in the water swimming with your buddies in in your in your communities in the sea. So recognising people when they've gone past the point of no return, starting to look a little bit confused, slurring their speech, doing really random things, they'll start to lose a little bit of mobility as well in their joints and coordination. So it's recognising when somebody might need your help if you are part of the swimming community, um, getting them out of the water. And then if they are to that point, you will have to help them get changed, get them warm. And then my suggestion is that they probably do need to seek medical advice at that point. So not to scare anybody, the winter swimming, the open water swimming is absolutely out of this world. We've got a huge community down here in Eastbourne. Um, lots of swimming goes on, lots of dipping. Um, it's just about making the right choices, looking out for each other, isn't it, as part of our community and um, yeah, lapping up what's out there for us to use. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. Um, <laughs> so some great tips there and lots of chat going on in the bar. Um, I noticed there and people sharing their experiences and comments and I, I'd agree. Um, so down here, I, I'm also very close to Eastbourne um, and I would just confess I'm also a boater, a motor boater. Um, and we've got a powerboat based at Eastbourne Marina. And when we go out, um, obviously we take off sure. But some of the swim groups are out and about. It is so much easier when they're visible for us to plot a route that avoids any um, any conflict there, because uh, sometimes it, it's visibility that can be your, you know, your lifesaver really in those situations. So, so true, Dee, uh, about swimming in the sea. Um, so some great messages there in terms of safety and more information in the links um, for those of you that don't already know. Um, 
before we end, so we've got about 10 minutes left and and I think throughout the conversation, if you're not convinced already that women have a vital role to play in um, supporting uh, swimming and safety in the water. Um, I think we heard about that nature and nurture um, aspect of women, the drawing together of communities and also the benefits the emphasising of benefits and educating young people, which I think are all things that actually women do brilliantly. Uh, I'm not saying that men can't do them. I'm just thinking women do them brilliantly. Um, I, I may confess to a, a, a moment of bias there. But what I would just say is that, you know, from what you've heard today, I hope you draw inspiration um, to talk to these women. They're all on Twitter, I think, yes. Um, and so after today, when we get out and about, um, you will find these ladies available on social media sites and you can tap into their knowledge outside of today's webinar and through, obviously, the organisations they, they work with as well. So in the last nine minutes or so of the webinar, I'd like to um, give people a chance to uh, ask some questions of our speakers. So um, don't be shy in the chat bar. Um, I'm going to pick up on a question that's asked earlier on. Forgive me, I'm scrolling back up because there's lots in the chat bar now um, to a question that was asked by Tracy, Tracy Hobden, thank you for your question. Um, Tracy was asking, would you recommend that each small swim group, and she's talking about sea swimming particularly, but it, it's equally applicable into inland, should be affiliated with a national group? So Dee's nodding. Dee, that's, that's a yes. I, t I, I, I believe that some of these smaller swimming groups would benefit from having an affiliation because perhaps then they were being fed information firsthand rather than some uh, online research that they might come across. So I definitely think it would help the safety aspect for sure. And, and Imogen, you touched on this, I think, um, about the fact that you know, affiliation... I think there, are big, uh, there are key bits. Yes, uh, I mean, basically, um, if you're in an informal group, then you're I, you're either in one that would be in the network or you can join the network of swim groups under the Outdoor Swimming Society. There's also the Blue Tits uh, group um, network as well and the Mental Health Swim. So any of those networks that, that, that you want to be part of, yeah, you get that benefit, like I was saying earlier, that for example, the one I know about is the Outdoor Swimming Society. We we look at we we talk with Mark Harper's on our, our our team, for example. So we we talk with those experts and we gather that information. We put out web pieces carefully researched, but we also pick up on questions that people feed in. So so yes, I think there's great value to that, definitely. Great, and lots and lots of commentary and, and agreeing and pointing to some of the points you've been talking about in the chat bar. Um, I've got another question. Um, if if I can just give every all the participants a chance, write it in the chat bar if you'd like to ask it. But um, it won't surprise you, ladies, um, because of the role that I do. Um, so apart from being involved in the emergency services and involved in rescue, which is when it all's gone completely peaked on. Um, I'm also an advocate for enjoying water safely. Um, I've been involved at the RLSS as a member for lots of years, was a trustee, and I, I chair the National Water Safety Forum. And I've got a question for you ladies, um, call this cheeky if you like, but the National Water Safety Forum are really keen to engage with lots of different organisations. We've got about 50 members so far. Um, and as we get out and about and we develop and deliver our Respect the Water campaign, we're looking for more opportunities to get the positive messages out there rather than the don't do's, the do it safely messages. So I'm after some tips and advice for you from you as the chair of National Water Safety Forum. As we get the this year's Respect the Water um, campaign launched, what would you like to say to make sure we get those consistent positive comms out there? Anybody, it's to any panel member. I 
I've stumped them all. I think you've got to reach everybody and that's stating the obvious, I realise, but I think it's going out beyond, isn't it? You've got to reach, I mean, people have mm. talked earlier, uh, Gabby, I think, and others, you know, reaching those young men in the pubs and making sure they know how to walk home safely and with a mate, that sort of thing. You know, ways of, I mean, this is where women do come into it, I think, as, as has been already said, women are mothers, they're friends and so on. and they're, it, it can sometimes be a little hard to pin down that that sort of rather nebulous, you know, spreading out of information. So I think, yeah, just making sure it, it reaches out as widely as possible and, and, and recognising the wide variety of people who are going to get into water uh, deliberately and they're going to be families, they're going to be children, they're going to be up. In, so, yeah. Great. Isabel. I'll, I'll let Gabby go first because I think she might say what I was going to say and I, <laughs> and I won't say it if she does. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, it was just that I think this is where we need the right representation of the right groups. So the only way to do this, to talk about it positively, is if we have representation of everyone. So where I say that, I'm talking about the variety of people who represent different heritage heritages across um, the UK and Ireland. It's about men influencing men of their own age, because I don't, as much as we have a lot of power as women, I think we need to represent the people that we represent I realize I've just said represent many times but that's that's where I just think that it's incredibly positive we are working um as the RLS said a number of organizations with the Black Women Association who are yeah. really trying hard to increase the importance of aquatics to people of Asian and African heritage for example so you know there's people from the LGBT community who also are there to support their own communities in getting involved in particular aspects of all society so I just think that we need to come about this across in the right way and to do that it's just about who who we're talking to so that's why I think children are actually the best people to talk to children yeah. to be honest I think the older yeah. generation are the best people to talk to the older generation um, I, knew Gabby, and I knew Gabby was going to say that <laughs> well I, th I thought you would say all of that and I, and I, I, I right completely page. agree and I was going to say something very similar that you know one of the things that I was conscious of when we were putting this together is that we've got a powerful ability to reach into the communities that we're reaching but I think we're very conscious about the ones that we're not reaching and we do sadly have incidents and fatalities not amongst swimmers in our neck of, on in our bit of the world um, it tends to be people who haven't gone out intending to get into the water so we can do some powerful kind of social norming in the groups that we can influence but we are quite conscious of the, of the groups that we don't reach and and I think that's the bit where the national bodies can work with us to 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 kind of identify who we're not reaching and and also maybe take suggestions from us about who else you might reach out to. Great. And I'm going to give the last um, moment and commentary here to Susan, who's got a hand up before I wrap up this afternoon's webinar. Can we hear you, Susan? You're still on mute. There's always one, isn't there? Now, I, I totally agree with what everyone has said, and I think that probably it's super, super important for us to be that collaborative voice, but make sure that the messages that we're giving are really meaningful and consistent so that it just makes our voices so, so strong. So, yeah, consistency, I think, is, is very key. Great. Thank you. Can I just make an, a really 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 huge thank you and i'm going to give you all a round of applause um, for your contributions this afternoon um, there's lots and lots of comments in the chat which we'll try and capture and respond to lots of really useful links what i want to do as well is just emphasize two other um, points if i can um, the first is that we have coming up very shortly the rospa um, drowning Prevention Conference. It's taking place in Cardiff this year and I know not everybody can get to Cardiff and, and also you know cost of travel and staying and everything might be prohibitive but I'm really interested in hearing from people. There'll be some fantastic speakers and presentations. We're going to record some of those and get them out there so do watch out from um, the feedback on that and I will be ensuring it is on the National Water Safety Forum's website so you can access it there. Also just to say that um, 
we're not stopping here. So water safety is not just about International Women's Day. Um, all of these wonderful contributors today have volunteered with their arms slightly up their back um, to also take part in some talking head videos, which we'll be recording through the year and dropping out, you know, through the year, whether it's about a bit more detail, perhaps even from swim locations um, about what they do and why they're passionate about it. So do watch out for forthcoming um, you know, sound bites and blogs and also messages from our wonderful contributors here and other people. Thank you so much to all the participate participants, sorry, no teeth, um, for joining in this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed the contributions. We will be recording it. There's lots of thank yous down the side, um, ladies, for your contribution. And if anybody else is interested, um, I am in the market for further webinars or blogs um, to share on this subject. It's a subject that's close and dear to my heart and everybody's heart. So promoting um, the, the wonders of safe water swimming is really important. Thank you for your contributions and enjoy your International Women's Day. Mm. Bye bye, everybody. Likewise, and thank you, Dawn. Thank you. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.